My audience, my listeners would absolutely kill me if we didn't at least a little bit cover crypto in this podcast. Peter, you're the first person to buy a Lamborghini Huracan in Bitcoin. Um, I'd love to hear a little more about, I know you said you've retracted a bit from the crypto community, mm. but um, where does crypto sit in your life now? Are, are you still as passionate about it as you were before? built many startups. Most of them have failed. And so Bitcoin is exactly the place that I like to be. We're going to end it right there. Hey, Peter. Hey, Karush. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I am awesome. It is a wonderful Thursday here. It's a little bit rainy over here in Atlanta, Georgia, but I'm excited to talk to you, brother. Well, it's funny. It's rainy there. It's absolutely boiling in London. We've got a heat wave right now, uh, but that's not going to stop me doing this podcast with you, Peter. You know, I am extremely excited to have you on the show. I've been a fan of yours for a while, but my audience may not know as much as I do about you. I normally don't like asking guests to give a quick introduction, but uh, in your case, there is so much to cover that some sort of background would be hugely helpful. Sure, I don't mind introducing myself. So hello everyone out there in the interwebs watching and or listening. My name is Peter Saddington. I am an agile coach, startup entrepreneur, three-time founder, and I love helping people level up their lives. And so if I were to summarize it up, I love teaching and training people in agile software development. I work with lots of clients. I also build startups. I've been acquired. I've gone through venture funding. And I love encouraging people to live their best lives. And so that's, I guess, essentially in a nutshell, what I'm all about. Yeah, it, like, I believe that as well so so purely because i've been following you for so long and every action you take everything you do resonates and exudes that message in and of itself i mean uh, at what point did a lot of people go into the startup world to build something and uh, make some money obviously that's a huge part of it but at some point the money must have stopped meaning anything to you and it went well beyond that well that's a, that's a that's an interesting interesting point for me, the money actually has never really meant all that much. And I think I can say that with a relative honesty and a relative transparency here. Of course, we have to be, think pragmatically and obviously we have to make income and these types of things. But I was always under the assertion that if you do a great job, you love on people and you serve other people in the work that you do, that the money will come. And in my experience, now I haven't lived that long, but I'm closer to 40 than anything else. In my experience, that that is absolutely true, is that when you find something, it's something that you can do in the service of others, and you do it with excellence, invariably, over time, invariably over time, you can make a good living wage on it. Now, we're not talking about getting maybe filthy rich here, but you can live a rewarding, fulfilling, purpose-filled life by serving other people, helping them grow in whatever you're good at and whatever you're, you know, you're a subject matter expert about. Uh, and that, I think that is, that is what is what life is all about. I think life is about helping and serving other people and through that, helping and serving yourself. And so it's a win-win. And so I'm, I'm a big fan. You've heard of this before, Karush, through some, probably some of my podcasts or some of my videos uh, back in the day. But the more that you give, the more that you get. And that's, that's a big theme of my life. Uh, that's something that took me a long time to learn because uh, I've since university, I've been jumping from business to business as well. And um, while I did make monetary gains on those businesses, all of them were temporary. There was some gap in the market I managed to use to make money, but none of them continually lasted. And that's because I didn't have that understanding of value delivery first. Make sure you deliver value. And if you're delivering more than you take, you're going to continually be able to do that. So take away the primary goal of the monetary benefit and focus on delivering value and you automatically get the monetary benefit. It just makes so much sense to take that approach. 
Absolutely. And actually, this is a tweet that I made on, on Twitter uh, probably a couple days ago. It was about this idea is that money can only be spent once. And once you spend that money, you have to earn more money. But knowledge, track with me here, knowledge monetizes forever. And so the focusing on garnering knowledge, becoming a subject matter expertise, and then learning how to communicate that out to the masses, to the public, to the people that need it, that monet, you can monetize that knowledge till the day is done, till the day is long, until your last final mm -hmm. breath. And so I, 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 and, and I'm bringing this up and it's coming out of my gut here because you use the word college and I'm playing off of you here, but a lot of kids who come out of college, they're trying to get the buck, totally get it, I was there, I understand that, but the buck diminishes, right? The dollar and making that money, it goes away. And so my advice to college students is to dig in Find something that you can really sink your teeth in, something that's really intriguing to you, something that you can continue to grow in and gain mastery over, whether it's, you know, it doesn't matter what it is, whatever subject that is interesting to you. And then the more that you learn, the more that you garner that knowledge, you can translate that and communicate that and educate that out to other people in the world. And again, that knowledge, and here's the key thing, here's the key thing, everyone out there listening, is that knowledge monetizes forever. Money goes away, but knowledge, the more knowledge that you can share with others, the more experience you can share with others, just like you're doing, Karush, with, with your newsletter, market meditations, with this podcast, you are monetizing your experience and knowledge, and you can do that ad infinitum. I mean, that is a great life of serving others with the knowledge that you've gained. Sounds like a great wow. recipe for success to me. Uh, knowledge monetizes. I couldn't agree more. And well, actually, what I'd ask then would be specifically with regards to monetizing knowledge. I know, Peter, you do a lot of different things. You're always jumping from business to business. Um, you prefer building as opposed to scaling. Now, where do you think people should focus on specific knowledge, uh, specialized knowledge, really getting um, expertise in some niche field or a more broad knowledge base, a jack of all trades approach? That's a great question and I appreciate you kind of using me as an example. I have bounced around, but what people don't realize is that I dabble a lot as I'm focused on one idea. For example, the first company that I built, I worked with, uh, for nine years and it was acquired in 2014. And so during those nine years, I was building, 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 working, working, grinding. And we ended up uh, at the tail end before I was acquired in 2014 with 19 employees. What other people don't realize is I was also focused on cryptocurrency and app development. And so I'm constantly juggling multiple things, but at the end of the day, I have a primary focus where 90% of my time is spent. And the reason why I believe it's important for everyone listening out there, instead of becoming a jack of all trades, I think it's so important to go deep on one particular idea, one particular topic, one particular subject, one particular grind or project or endeavor. And the reason is, and I'll give you an example, is you want to have mastery over it. If you look at a master pianist, you know, a, someone who spent 30 years, 40 years mastering the art of piano and everything about that, as they're, they're, as they're playing that piano piece, their hands are moving smoothly across the keyboard. They, 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 they play these extravagant, complex pieces with such ease. And you look at them and you say, man, it looks so easy. Well, the reason why it's easy is because they have received a level of mastery. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is you can only truly enjoy that which you do when you have mastery. I was talking to my uh, daughter about this in, in regards to tennis, and she was saying, tennis is hard. I'm like, tennis is hard because you're still a beginner at it. You're still a newbie. But after you gain mastery, then you get to have the real fun. When someone serves it to you, you know exactly how to spin it, you know exactly how to hit it, you know exactly where to pivot, you know where to position yourself in, um, preemptively for the ball. This all comes with experience, time in the seat and mastery over time. And so you can only, so if I could summarize it up, you can only truly enjoy 
that which you do after you've suffered for years, learning that trade, learning that craft, growing that knowledge base. I'll give you an example right right here. The reason I can speak to you so fluently about what I do is because I have practiced for decades, two plus decades, 20 plus years in communicating my ideas, my thoughts to other people. And so I'm an effective communicator. I'm not, this is not a, you know, you know, rub your, you know, brush off your shoulders, you know, you know, humble brag, but let's be intellectually honest. I'm a good communicator because I've spent so much time practicing it. To, later today, I have a, a, a webinar, you know, that I'm doing uh, for, for 50 plus people. And I'm talking about my experiences and what I've learned about through startups. I love sharing that knowledge. But again, the reason why it's smooth and it's coming off my tongue smoothly here is because I've mastered it. And so if you're coming, if you're coming out of college or you want to, if you want to really have true freedom, true freedom, freedom is only found in mastery of an idea or mastery of a subject. And so that freedom comes at a cost. It comes at the cost of suffering, time, time in the seat, growing, learning. That's what it's all about. Does that make sense? That, I mean, obviously it makes sense. You communicate the ideas so well, you bring in examples and your passion shines through. I can, like, you can almost hear it in your voice, how passionate you are about the things you say. And I think another aspect, which isn't even trained, is the genuineness. When you're not being genuine in what you say, there's so many other uh, cognitive clogs, you know, like mm -hmm. stuff stopping you saying what you're thinking because you, you're hiding the genuineness. But when mm -hmm. everything you say comes from your heart, then it's very easy to communicate these sorts of ideas. Peter, you said so many things I want to expand upon. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I, I guess I'd start with uh, we talked about having to go through years of suffering. Um, mm -hmm. I watched an incredible podcast the other day about um, a champion figure skater who, at the age of 14, um, was the American champion. Mm -hmm. And in that sort of instance, uh, nature takes a huge role. Obviously, nurture and experience and practice is important. Um, how important do you think is it is, is is it that people know their strengths and don't just suffer to master a skill which they're not suited for? Well, I, I, I have a. I think it's important to understand over time what your strengths emerge to be, and your strengths can change over time. I think there's going to be for for most people there's going to be a core foundation of your strength. For me, for example, and I'm, I can just leverage myself here, a core foundational strength for me, and, and it's something that I've trained over many years, is the art of communication. I'll go even deeper. For years, I spent time researching even better and more complex communication patterns and communication techniques like the art of the dialectic. Some of you guys might not, never have heard of this. The art of the dialectic is what the street preachers of, of, the, of the centuries past used to do. What they, uh, the art of the dialectic essentially is espousing an idea or an, a concept and then through the art of communication, narrative and storytelling, being able to defend that point even before you have kind of fully formed the idea. And so the street preachers, for example, in the old days, someone would yell at them and say, well, what about this question? I don't understand this about God. And they'd say, well, you're wrong. Now, they haven't formulated the rationale and reasoning for why it's wrong, but through storytelling and through conversation, they're able to create that rationale and reasoning and be able to create proofs for that assertion after they've asserted it. And so great storytellers, great salesmen have mastered the art of the dialectic. Someone will say, hey, to a salesman, can you deliver this to me? And they'll say, yes. And then they'll, in their mind, they'll be like, well, how the hell am I gonna do that? Well, great <laughs> communicators, great guys who have mastered the art of the dialectic can say, yes, I can deliver that. And then they start talking and then they start bringing up examples. And then suddenly they're able to prove what they asserted before they even could really realize if it was assertable. And so that's something that, for example, that I've, I've mastered. And so when it comes to communication, that's a foundational basis for me, but other skills can be grown. I think it's important. I think it's important to remember here, Karush, that every single child born, 
Every single child born has the ability to speak any language on the planet. Actually, through their babbling, as the, as the kids are, you know, babbling and talking, they actually pretty much use all the phonics of every other language out there. It is only when the child realizes that certain sounds only apply to their context, whether they're in America, uh, whether they're in China or Korea or, or UK, right? And so they start losing the ability to communicate in other languages because contextually, they have no need for those other phonics and those other word sounds. And so here, what's the point I'm trying to make? Everyone on the planet, you have an infinite palette in front of you. The world is your oyster. When you are born, you literally can do anything. This is true. The question is, is what have you constrained yourself? How, how have you constrained yourself? How have you had that self-talk that's told you you can't do X or can't do Y? Where have you lost the ability to be creative or innovative or thoughtful about opportunities? It's the world that ends up constraining us. When we're a baby, the world is our oyster. And as we grow and we grow and we grow, we lose two things. We lose the power of imagination and we lose the power of potential. And so, so much of what I try to encourage people is, is you all have infinite possibilities and infinite potential, and you can do anything. Frankly, I am never ashamed, Krush. I'm never ashamed, and even somewhat communicating it somewhat egotistically, when someone says, hey, is, you know, is, is this something that you can learn? And I stare right back, and I'm like, I can learn anything. Give me time, give me intentionality, Give me focus and I can master that thing. Now, you know, I'm old now, so I can't master it as fast as maybe young, younger, you know, young bloods could, uh, but you can master anything. And so the, back to your question, should we focus? Should we become a jack of all trades? Or we focus deeply? Focus deeply. S learn that craft. Grow that craft. And after you've gotten to a point, maybe 10 years, pivot. You can try something else. You can, you can do, do something different. Go to a different market, try something new, but don't quit too early. I think so many people, they try to get into something, they go into it a couple years and they're like, man, it's so, so hard, it's so much struggle here. I'm not, I'm not fully working at my full potential. It's like, that's because you've only been in a couple years, bro. Give it more time, give it more time. I hope that was a, a good answer to it. Um, every answer seems to be an amazing answer. You've motivated me to improve on these communication skills deliberately. Man, Peter, the way you um, are able to communicate your message is unlike anything I've seen before. It's really impressive. You truly have mastered this skill. Uh, I guess what you said about people as they grow losing their the potential and possibilities, not, yeah. Yeah, losing their potential and possibilities. And even what you said, you, you're not able to learn it as fast as young people. I I hear that a lot as well. A lot of my audience are older than me and um, I'm sure they've succeeded a lot in other areas of life, but in certain ones I've done a bit more so I have knowledge to share. And they say, I'm now too old to learn it. My brain isn't as sharp. Well, Okay, your brain may have been sharper when you were in school, but could that maybe be because you were studying nine different topics, doing 10 different sports a year, learning new languages, um, just constantly exposing your brain to all these things? It's, it's the change in environment more than the change in age. I, I completely agree. Uh, so I, I am a homeschool parent. So <laughs> my kids are homeschooled. And the reason is, is because I want them to focus. I want them to use their imagination. I want them to do project-based work. And frankly, let's be intellectually honest, it is not important for my son or my daughter to know the capital of of Kenya today. <laughs> you know, it's it's like I like there's so much that it untapped potential in my children. And by throwing them into courses and ideas that they clearly are disinterested in is not only a waste of time, but it's a waste of life. And that energy could be put towards something that they are uniquely, uniquely interested in. Let's be intellectually honest. You are only going to be willing to suffer, and I'll, I'll define this in a little bit, but you are only willing to suffer something as long as you are interested in it and there is an outcome or a goal associated or attached to that effort. You are only willing to suffer. And what do I mean by suffer? 
I believe that one of the best things that we have as humans is that we have the ability to choose our own suffering. To succeed in anything requires a, a focus and a determination to do that which you don't want to do when you know you should do it. For example, you need to wake up early. Wake up. Do it. It's painful. It's suffering. You're so comfortable under those sheets and the little fan that's blowing. It feels so good to be there. But you know that if you want to get to the next level, you got to get up, not hit that snooze button. That's an example of suffering. Another example of suffering is taking that trip, having that meeting, meeting that person when you're feeling sick. Bro, you told me you're feeling sick and you're having this meeting. Clearly, you have enough energy, passion, dedication, and commitment to still talk to me, even though that you're feeling under the weather. And so you are choosing your suffering because you know that there's a worthy goal and that there's a worthwhile outcome from what you're putting in. And so we as humans, out of all the species on the planet, we as humans have the unique opportunity to choose the suffering that we want to go through, to achieve the goals that we have in mind. And so I, I believe that puts us on a completely different plane than anyone else, especially if you realize that and you internalize it and you take it on. You say, hey, I don't need to suffer in this way. I don't need to suffer in this, this way. I can, I can choose my suffering. I can choose my own path. Yeah, it might, it might be more suffering than the nine to five job that I have and stuck in a cubicle right now. Yeah, there's probably gonna be more suffering, but you have the autonomy to be able to choose that and to pick that life for yourself. And I, I think that's a life worth, worth living, is a, a life where you accept the suffering for the outcome or the out cause that you want at the end of it. Yeah, we, we, we have the ability to either consciously or subconsciously choose our suffering. I consciously choose the suffering that helps me get to the goals I want to get to. Other people just like bury their head in the sand and let whatever suffering the world wants to throw at them throw at them because suffering is inevitable it, we have the ability to choose what we want in order to reach our goals and it's a fantastic point uh, especially with um what you said about the nine to five i, I love when people who obviously are real entrepreneurs can say that the nine to five is less painful than starting your own business. When you're running your own business, everything is on you. There is no security. Like you said, I'm under the weather, but Peter, if I take the day off today, then it's my business that's suffering. So it's different. It's, it's not like taking a sick day at work. That's the fundamental difference. And I obviously encourage everyone to do their own, start their own businesses and take risks and do whatever uh, they, it is they want to do, if that is the nine to five. But for those who are more leaning towards the entrepreneurial lifestyle, don't take the sugar-coated image that Instagram and uh, a lot of the modern social media platforms like to give. It's it's a brutal, tough, extremely rewarding and beautiful life, but it is the first half as well, brutal and tough, which I'm sure you know better than most people do. And in fact, um, I know you run your agile courses. Now, I know agile courses may not be the right phrase to summarize everything you do around agile, but you actually try to teach people how to, well, I mean, you're going to explain it much better than I am. <laughs> so so uh, I do online workshops now in this new reality. I used to fly to clients weekly and, and train and teach people. And uh, But essentially what at the Agile courses are, the, the two that I do the most right now are what we call a certified Scrum Master course and a certified Scrum product owner course. And essentially these two courses help you understand how to deploy Agile and Scrum into your organization or your team so that you can build products faster. For me as a startup entrepreneur, Agile and startups, they go hand in hand. For me, I've had to build in an agile fashion. I'd have to iterate quickly, create tests, create hypotheses, execute against those experiments and to understand and get feedback from the community, get feedback from our users. And so this is what I teach large companies and startups alike to do is to build products faster, to get that feedback from your users, your customers, your clients, or the community, and, and use that feedback to make the product better. And so at, at the corporate level, what the corporate guys like to hear is it increases, right? Increases value to our customers. It increases our ability to make more money. We can deliver software with quality faster. These are all the, the outcomes of agile software development. And so those are the two main courses that I do, and I do those pretty much almost every other week or so. 
but I also do a lot of workshops and so and, and startup workshops and kind of one-off workshops for clients depending on their own needs. Uh, but one of the things that I used to do, which I want to do more of uh, coming up, is more kind of behind the scenes kind of the coaching, mentoring stuff that you've, you've taken a part of where I can help people, uh, entrepreneurs or anyone that's, that, that is interested in self-improvement and help them begin to open up some of those doors of possibilities in their mind that they've had shut for so long. Um, I, 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 as I get closer and closer to 40 years old, I, uh, let's just say I can't speak too specifically around it, but I am starting to see people wither and die. I'm starting to see the, 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 the whole idea of the age, you know, age affecting uh, colleagues, friends, and network. And it's quickening me. It really is quickening me, Crush. It, it, it's helping me realize that life is so daggone short and that if I'm not doing my best work now, when am I going to do it? If I'm not going to be leveraging my talents and my knowledge to serve others now, when am I going to do it? If I'm not willing to take those risks and try those things now, then when am I going to do it? I mean, we have one life, as far as I know, uh, we have one life to live and daggone it, I want to make sure that I'm the man standing in the arena with blood on his face, his hands calloused from work. When everyone else is jeering and cheering and people call saying, you know, you're, you failed, you messed up. Doesn't matter what you say. I was in the arena. You were in the stands and my life was well lived. Uh, let's live life in the, sta in the arena, man. Um, it, win or lose, win or lose. That's where I want to live life. And uh, I mean, you, you said that you want to do this and you are doing this, but you've been doing this for a long time and a lot of our listeners don't know that you have had a huge impact on me in fact uh one of your courses on youtube it was a huge one uh it motivated my entire social media journey you had me focus my goals you had me make sure i reach them a little bit at a time every single day not be afraid of failure um know when to like you said iterate if something doesn't work okay instantly come back try it again pivot when you need to it really is uh something which anyone can do but not everyone knows they can do and that's part of what you do when you teach them you show them that they can do it as well and it is an incredible arena to be in an arena to live your life in um mm. so what makes you pre prefer to do that over continue build companies because you've done three incredibly successful ones uh, you've had a lot of other ventures you've been involved in as well which have been successful um why now the shift towards teaching rather than continuing to build, which I know you're doing anyway, but what's come across is that that's a huge, uh, a huger goal for you right now. Well, you've, you've said it very well. I'm still building. Uh, there's, I have a, a kind of a, a shadow project that I'm working on that's not re yet ready for prime time. Uh, but I love community. I love connecting with people. And in my last startup, which was venture funded in the cryptocurrency world, um, after that, after we, I finished with that, I, I kind of unplugged myself a little bit from the crypto, crypto community. And I think that was a healthy thing for me. I was so deep in it. And there was just, there's so many facets to the crypto world, especially as a content creator, going to conferences, doing speaking, obviously creating content every day on multiple platforms, uh, these types of things. And I needed to extract myself for a little bit. And what I miss the most about that is the community is being able to have connections with other people who want to do life. And that's like, that's what I'm all about. If I can bring people to myself who are interested in doing life together, let's do it. Why the hell not? Why not spend some time learning from each other, sharpening each other's blades, talking with one another when, when, when there's no one else to talk to? Or being a little bit more formal, having workshops and creating workshops for people so that they can learn and grow and level up. That was one of the things that personally really affected me and is close to my heart. And I really, really enjoyed that community aspect. So right now I'm spending a lot of time building that back up or building that up kind of more in a general sense, not just specific to the crypto world. And so I have a site, vchunting.com, which I'm creating a community site on. 
Obviously, there's a lot of stuff there on Agile and how to how to improve software and how to build software faster and kind of the, the nuances around Agile coaching, Scrum Mastery, and building better products as a product owner. For sure, there's a lot of bias there. But one of the things that I want to do also is expand that community into the self-improvement world. And so that I can be a voice to people and encourage them throughout the day, maybe even daily. Actually, I did enjoy doing daily shows for a long while back, back a little back then. Um, and I so, was watching those. <laughs> I know those were a lot, those are a lot of fun, and and so you get to you get to really expand your network. You get to meet new people, um, and you get to just do life together. Because man, life is better done in a circle rather than a row. Let me repeat that because that's really important. Life is better done in a circle than a row. When you're in a row, you're just a consumer, right? But when life is done in a circle, it's we have interactivity, we have conversations, we get to get to share ourselves. And maybe and it's something that I love is we get to be radically transparent about the shit in life, about the real, what I would sometimes call the real real. Life's not perfect, life's not pretty all the time. I'm not perfect, I mess up, I have hard days, I got crappy days. and. If, if, if people can take from that and see that I'm just another regular carbon-based life form, flesh and blood like you, then maybe that can be just enough encouragement to help them get past that break point or get to the next level where they need to be. You have such profound answers to everything I ask. Every action you take seems to be really well thought out. So I'd love to hear your take on how you balance uh, living life in a way where you're in the arena, you're really doing as much as you can with your life and the family, because um, it, it takes everything from me. Like when I'm trying to build something, it is my obsession. There is, I, I struggle to fit anything else into it, especially friends and family. I'd love to know um, how you manage to do that and what role they play in your grand picture. Great question. My family comes first. And so it might seem like I'm super busy, which I am. I'm all over the place. I got lots of stuff going on, but I'm also blessed. And what I mean by that is I homeschool. I get to work in my garage. I have access to my wife and my kids all the time. And so for me, that presence was something, was a principle. It was a principle-based decision for me that having presence with my family was something that I would not compromise. And I actually really enjoy uh, this new kind of reality that we're in because all of my clients are like, well, we can't meet in person. I'm like, okay, we'll meet on Zoom. That works just fine for me. Um, and, 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 and my ability to communicate and effect, uh, effectively communicate with them isn't hampered by the fact that I'm not physically present, although that physical presence add, adds a dynamic that I think is valuable and irreplaceable in some ways. Um, and so for me, let's go back to kind of your original context of your question or your idea here is that you said that everything that I, I talk about is well thought out. It is well thought out. And the reason is, is because I live a life of intention. I live a life of intentionality. I learned early on that if you have no goal and you have no and you have no path, then any path and any goal will suffice. The problem is, is I, I don't want to live that way. I don't want to be swayed by the wind. I don't want to go where the crosswinds go. I don't want to go where the next fad goes. I have distinct and unique interests, and I am self-aware enough that those interests have enough pull, and enough gravity that I should embark on that journey. And so for me, I never wanna wake up and, and, and spend the day and then put my back on my bed and my head on my pillow and say, damn, man, I did a whole bunch of nothing. You know, I wasted a day, and you don't have many of those days. And so for me, I, everything that I do is well thought out in, in most cases, in terms of the meta of my life and what I want to do at the high level, not all the details are thought out, but just the, the larger goals are thought out, as well as I want to live a life of intention where what I do actually matters and what I do actually moves the ball forward. I am a huge stickler, and you've probably heard this before, but I am a huge stickler on sideways energy. We burn so much time. It is irrational. Can I get can I get uh, preachy for a second first? <laughs> like, go ahead, Peter. It is irrational when I hear people. I hear this all the daggone time. People, I got no time. I don't have enough time. What are you talking about, bro? You just burned four hours on TikTok. You just burned, you know, two hours watching the tweeters. You, you burned five hours on Netflix. You're like, 
like the average American spends like seven hours on like media or some peripheral device a day. Like, don't ever tell me you don't have time because you didn't need to watch that Netflix. You didn't need to watch the boob tube. And you certainly didn't need to watch that, that, you know, that person dancing on TikTok. You have the time. You have the opportunity. If you take command of your life and take personal responsibility for who you are and where you are and what you are now, because every single thing, every, every single part of you today has emerged to be you through every decision you've made. So you are a culmination of every decision you thought you made, you wish you hadn't made, all the screw ups, all the successes, you are a culmination of all of that. And so you are 100% responsible for where you are today. And pe- I think a lot of people have missed that, that aspect. They, they want to push responsibility off to someone else. They want to say, this is the reason I am. That's the, this is the reason I can't, you know, that's the person who said I won't, you know, this is, this is the, this is the constraints that I have that preclude me from being who I truly look, shut up, <laughs> shut up. No, you accepted that. You made that part of your identity. You made that part of your narrative. And the narrative is wrong. The story you're telling yourself is wrong. Take personal responsibility today. Live a life of intention and live a life of purpose. And when you do, you will suffer. But I'll tell you, you'll be standing in the arena. And when you go out, it'll be a life well lived. He who says he can and he who says he can't, they're often right. Like, yeah, right. I've had a lot of uh, successful people on this podcast now, and the one common variable that is every every single time there is mindset. It, it, I, I almost don't like talking about it because it comes across as something anyone can talk about. Oh, mindset isn't going to make me rich. Mindset isn't going to get me in shape. Mindset isn't going to do anything, but it is absolutely everything. And it's, it's that intention, that deliberate intention. And don't even get me started on, I don't have time, Peter. (laughs) Like when you get to the point where you're trying to bring your meals from five meals a day down to three meals a day, so you can fix an extra hour of work in, then you can tell me you don't have time for something. But outside of that, it really, you, you you can make, you don't want to make time. It's not that you don't have time. You don't want to make time for whatever your goal is. Uh, Very rarely do people, is time really an excuse? And I guess you answered the family question with that as well. You make time, there's deliberate intention and you make time to both fit your family in and your work, which um, I need to get better at. Honestly, I need to get better at. I really let friends and family relationships suffer when I get too obsessed with work. And have you always had this? Was there a point where you didn't have this balance? Uh, Just because this is almost selfish, I want to learn from you to know how this balance can be found. Uh, I I wish I could say that I've always been this mature. Uh, The unfortunate reality is is that I wasn't always this mature. And so when I was a younger, younger man and I was not married, I had more... I was more prone to burnout, um, and the reason is is because I was just, just like bloodlust hungry to succeed, and 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 my life has changed a lot since I ever ever since I got married over a decade ago and had two kids, two beautiful kids, um, but before before I was married, I was a lot more thirsty for success and thirsty for making money, get, making my first million, making my second, you know, looking at my bank account. Like these are all immature things to talk about. I get it. I concede that, concede that idea. But this was my reality, you know, 15, 20 years ago is what I cared about most was just making money. And I didn't care about my health as much. I didn't care about the sustainable pace that I should have had. Uh, I, I would, I would compromise sometimes my values for the dollar. Um, I'm not, I wasn't immune to these, to these variables. I wasn't immune to these risks and I wasn't immune to these temptations. And so it was a progressive, what I like to call a progressive realization of self and the valuing of myself that helped me become more responsible and be more intentional with my life. And what what does that mean? It means I learned that I'm valuable. I mean, it took me a long time to realize that this is the only machine that I got. I need to feed it premium oil, premium food. It needs to get premium rest. It needs, I need to be actively engaged in what I do because that's where the mind is the best, right? When you're in a state of flow and focusing on something deeply, 
right? I learned all of these things. So I have three master's degrees in the social sciences. Uh, I spent a lot of time in education, understanding the human mind, uh, the, the cognitive psychology of humans, as well as the behavior of humans. And, and learning all of this helped me value myself more, that this is a one-time deal. This is a one-time deal, a one chance in a lifetime opportunity to make this machine do my bidding. And the war, the constant war that I fight today is the internal resistance in my head. There is that which I know that I should do and that which the resistance says you don't need to do. And so every day I have to fight that resistance to live a life of intentionality, live a life of purpose, and be an individual who serves others before he serves himself. And so it's taken time. I wasn't always a mature man. I was selfish and I was and all that stuff. Um, I enjoyed having Lamborghinis before anyone else did, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, you know, it, it's, 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 a, it's a more healthy, sustainable lifestyle now than certainly 15, 16, 17 years ago, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it's reassuring to hear that it took you some time to get to this um, more balanced state in, in, that you're in now. Um, also, when you were talking about uh, fueling the machine, I couldn't help but remember uh, an episode of uh, your YouTube channel that I watched where you talked about mastering the full ab roll. I know that's a very difficult move. Congratulations <laughs> on getting it. As a gymnast, I could definitely appreciate that, Peter. Um, and of course, you mentioned the Lamborghini. Now, my audience, my listeners would absolutely kill me if we didn't at least a little bit cover crypto in this podcast. Peter, you're the first person to buy a Lamborghini Huracan in Bitcoin. Um, I'd love to hear a little more about, I know you said you've retracted a bit from the crypto community, mm. but um, where does crypto sit in your life now? Are, are you still as passionate about it as you were before? For sure. I mean, uh, for everyone out there listening, what you don't see is my Bitcoin shirt. I'm wearing a Bitcoin shirt right now. So I still am deep in the crypto space. I still create uh, applications for the crypto space. I still consult. Actually, next week I have a conversation with a, a, a cryptocurrency venture capital fund uh, um, that I'm going to be uh, potentially advising. And so I'm still deep in the crypto world. I'm just not spending as much time in the content and community space. Um, and it's not that my it's not that my interests have changed. It's just that I think in in a lot. Well, I think and it would be fair that my interests within the cryptocurrency have changed to more of the more of the application side and less of the content side. And so I want to spend more time helping companies actually build applications rather than spending time hanging out with the crypto community, which I love and I miss, but I, I have to choose one, right? I can't, I can't, I don't have time for everything. And so speaking of the, the, the Bitcoin Lamborghini, um, with my, with my venture funded project that we venture funded for just shy under $5 million from investors from San Francisco, Korea, Japan, China, it was just a great bunch of people that believed in me and believed in what we were doing. Uh, I created a marketing campaign and the whole idea is that no one at the time, this was back in 2016, 17, no one at the time had bought a Lamborghini Huracan uh, with cryptocurrency. And so I said, you know, I'm a car lover. Cars are in my, my gene pool. It's a genetic disposition, maybe even a genetic disorder that I love cars and racing so much. Uh, my son's got it. My dad had it. I mean, it, it's all over. And I figured, you know, how do, how do I make a marketing splash? So what I did, I bought the world's first 2015 Lamborghini Huracan uh, with Bitcoin. 45 Bitcoins were spent on it. And those Bitcoins, because I had invested in the cryptocurrency early on in 2011, that, that Lamborghini only cost like 250 bucks or so uh, from the initial, the, the initial investment. And so uh, that got me internationally viral. I think 300 million plus views from Maxim to Yahoo Finance to, to Forbes to, you know, all over the place, all over the place. So you can just, if you type in Bitcoin Lambo or Peter Saddington Lambo, you'll see all the news about it. And so that was my 15 minutes of fame. But it was a great marketing campaign because it brought people to me. It got, it got people interested, maybe on the money side, maybe it was a little clickbaity, I get it, yeah, yeah, yeah. However, when they got 
to see me and they got to see what I'm all about, I hope that my authenticity, my transparency, and who I am was able to shine past the glitz and the glamour of a Lambo. Uh, but it wasn't my first. So, I mean, I've been in this uh, exotic sports cars for my whole life. And so this wasn't just something that I did on a whim, but rather it was pretty much aligned with who I am anyway. It was just cool to be able to buy a car instead of with cash, I could buy it with crypto earnings. I mean, it was extremely cool. 300 million plus views yeah. cool. Um, people absolutely loved it. And I, I definitely find it's a tricky topic, the clickbait one. Uh, is it okay to draw an audience in uh, with something a little vain and unhealthy? Like, uh, I, mean, I mean, your love for the car comes from a healthy place. You're not buying a Lamborghini to show off to your friends and make them feel bad that you have a Lamborghini. You're buying a Lamborghini because it's in your DNA. You yep. love your Lamborghini. I know your son loves go-karting. Um, yep. it's, it's, it's something you genuinely love and you got because you love and you managed to sync it up with a marketing thing. And well, I was one of the people who found you and I can confirm that your genuine message did shine through. And that's part of the way I run what I do. I mean, my slogan is building richer lives and that's uh, health, wealth and happiness and everything I do tries to do that. And one place in which I try to do that is promoting cryptocurrencies. I truly believe that cryptocurrencies are one of the best solutions we have uh, to a broken financial system. And that is why I'm so deeply involved in cryptocurrency. And I'd say I'm maybe in the other side. If you're on the building side, I'm more right now in the exposure side. Mm. Um, what do you think it's one is better than the other? One should trans transfer over to one side or are both still necessary? Are we too heavily weighted on one side versus the other? No, I don't think so at all. I think I think we've had multiple – since I've been in cryptocurrency since 2011, I have seen multiple waves of what I would call content creators come and go. And so there's – I always look at it as like classes. So I was kind of the class of content creators from the 2016 to 2018 period of your your, your, your – who, who else was popular during that time or, or was – raised up during that time. We're talking box about like mining. Your box mining, data, data dash, uh, grew, grew it during that time. Um, Ivan on tech grew during that time. And so I'm part of like that class of cryptocurrency content creator. Now there's a newer class that I've seen rise in the 2019 wave to now 2020 wave. And so I, I believe that there can never be enough content creation, especially in the cryptocurrency space. It needs to be promoted. It needs to be communicated out because as I've said, and I believe that because Bitcoin and crypto are protocol based and the internet likewise is a protocol, the internet is continuing to expand ad infinitum across the world. At some point in time, everyone in the planet is going to be connected to the internet at some level, whether it's on a mobile, a tablet, or a computer. Likewise, cryptocurrency as a protocol will continue to expand ad infinitum until everyone is touched. And so does that make cryptocurrency and Bitcoin a worthy investment? Absolutely, 100%. It's going to expand. It's going to continue to grow. Do we need more people promoting it, communicating, educating people on cryptocurrency? 100%. As content creators leave, like myself, who've left the content creation world of crypto, others need to come in and continue to promote it and, and, and market it out. But we also need more builders, for sure. So my short answer to your question is, are there is there too much of one or not enough of another? There is need a plenty for both. So if you're an engineer developer, there are great new venture capital funds. There are great investors that are willing to invest in your crypto project. So look it up, Google it, find those people. I'm like, I, I think I said before, I'm meeting with a cryptocurrency venture fund next week um, and they have millions of dollars to deploy into these uh, to great ideas and we need more content creators. So that's it. We need both. The more in the crypto space, the more people building and promoting the message, the better. And relieved to hear that Peter is still heavily invested in uh, cryptocurrencies in general. Is Peter invested in anything else besides crypto as opposed to um, with regards to his portfolio? 
No, um, I don't mind saying it and saying it plainly. I, when I went into cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, I liquidated all my accounts. Roth IRA, traditional IRA, mutual funds. Uh, I, I, I just, I did not see the, the value of hodling uh, traditional assets that made me half a percent of half a percent of nothing um, over the years. I could dump it into a scam coin. Uh, even if I dumped $1,000 in a scam coin, I could make more money uh, by just one tick than what I would earn on interest on all of it within a year. And so I remember having this conversation with my financial advisor and I told him, I, this was back in, this was way back uh, in 2016. Um, is I, I told him, I said, I need to liquidate all my assets. He was like, everything? I was like, yes. Money market, traditional, Roth, mutual. I was, he was like, bro, you're going to take like a 50 and then another hit after that. And, and you know, 50% or 65% or whatever. And I was like, don't care. Because I can make <laughs> more money in this thing called cryptocurrency. And he literally, on the phone, he was like, crypto what? Crypto What? what are you is this like some nigerian scam and i was like no bro it's even worse just give me my money <laughs> so i liquidated all my accounts i remember creating a video about it i think in 2016 um talking about this but yeah i liquidated them all and so all my assets are in crypto now man it's just i just i believe that heavily in that system and frankly there's no need to be storing up fiat in in something that makes you no money Wow, Peter, I, I've been following you a while. I actually did not know you had that level of exposure to crypto. Uh, so just entirely crypto, no, there's, you, have, you hold no other assets besides crypto. I mean, I have a traditional bank account checking, a checking and a savings for the family and all that stuff. So your usual run of the mill. But when it comes to investments, I own zero traditional investments. It's all in crypto. Wow. Um, I mean, you, you, you preach it and your actions definitely match it as well. Uh, personally, I take a slightly different approach. Uh, I do have those, you know, low percentage uh, index funds. Um, I believe in diversification. Uh, I still believe there's a possibility that something uh, that is in crypto comes out that is a better solution to the financial um, the oh. for, I'm not, I'm not telling you not to diversify. You should totally diversify. I just have a philosophical principle-based decision here that I made is that for me, the principle-based decision was I was no longer willing to support a, a, a Fed coin, essentially, you know, a, a, the traditional money system that is bleeding uh, us of our wealth and is bleeding us of our happiness and bleeding us of our, of our you know, ability to live effectively. Like, you know, when gas prices go up, people are like, oh, the gas prices are going up. No, 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 the gas prices aren't going up. Your dollar is just worth less. Um, you know, they continue to inflate this, the, that, that money. And so for me, it was a principle-based decision. I, I think most people, 99% of people, everyone out there, you should probably diversify. Uh, but for me, I just could no longer support a system that I just vehemently oppose in so many ways. That's really admirable, Peter. And um, I guess you made sure, like with your checkings account, that you have enough in an apocalypse scenario with that, that you'll be okay and you will survive. Oh, trust me, in, in, in an apocalypse scenario, you won't be trying to access your Bitcoin and you certainly won't be able to eat your gold <laughs> or your dollars. What you're going to be worried about are your next door neighbors, number one. And number two, you're going to wonder about if you have enough ammunition. Um, so <laughs> so in, in, in the case of an, a zombie apocalypse, I got plenty of guns and plenty of ammunition and I have food rations. I'm ready. Uh, so the money thing is going to be the least of our concerns, I think. <laughs> I guess Peter is prepared for everything. It's great to hear. And um, what an amazing note to uh, conclude this podcast on. Peter, thank you so much for joining me. I've learned so much. I just can't wait for, to listen to this podcast again and go over everything you've said. Uh, is there anything you'd like to leave our listeners with uh, before we wrap up this episode? Nothing other than the fact that I want everyone out there to be blessed. Thank you so much, Karush, for doing this. Uh, it's just great to be able to talk with you. And by the way, I wouldn't mind coming on again if you want to deep dive into a topic or or do something that's uh, a little bit more specific than an overall general idea. I'd be more than willing. Other than that, guys, you can find me on Twitter at Agile Peter. 
and I'd love for you to check out our community if you're interested at vchunting.com. But other than that, everyone out there in Caruso, thanks so much. Be blessed. I can vouch for Peter. Anything that Peter does will probably be high quality. Make sure you check out his Twitter. Make sure you follow his website and try get on one of his courses. You won't regret it. It'll help you build the business of your dreams. Thank you again, Peter. Uh, I will see everyone next time.